Napoleon wasn't short. That was British propaganda. He was, however, short of money. That too was thanks to the British. Monsieur Bonaparte had his eyes on France's eternal enemy and hoped to finance a military that could finish them off once and for all. Best of luck with that, I'm sure it'll go swimmingly. He'd also recently spent a lot of money losing the French colony of Saint-Domingue to a slave revolution. The newly free slaves would go on to establish the country of Haiti, setting out into the systematically hostile and racist world of 19th century diplomacy. Best of luck with that, I'm sure it'll go swimmingly. But right now, in the present, 1803, Napoleon's wholly in need of simoleons. Luckily for him, France owns a massive piece of land that's lying around not doing very much. Oh, sorry, forgot to change the slide. It's called Louisiana, and ah, uh, no, not that one. Because we're in the era when Europeans could draw lines on a map to claim half a continent they'd never even visited, French Louisiana actually refers to this enormous blob of North America. The French hadn't explored most of it, but it was theirs. Hey, screw the natives, right? With the loss of Saint-Domingue, Louisiana's strategic importance to France had dwindled. That and a host of other diplomatic problems made Louisiana more of a liability than anything else. So why not simply sell it to make a quick buck? Damn it, I mentioned buying huge amounts of land, didn't I? The Louisiana Purchase, the sale of French Louisiana to the 30-year-old United States of America, was one of the largest and most influential land exchanges in history. By all accounts, it was a good deal for all parties. Okay, not all parties. France squeezed some final cash out of a neglected colony instead of entangling itself in geopolitical spaghetti to defend it, and America doubled its size overnight at bargain basement prices. I'm sure they won't get addicted to it. But there's one factor behind the Louisiana Purchase that few ever mention. It wasn't the deciding factor. It probably wasn't even all that important. But it's fascinating and illuminating, and just the right level of clickbait for a semi-respectable YouTube video. The United States of America is the way it is today, partially thanks to mammoths. Mammoths, as we all know, were big hairy animals that lived during the Ice Age. Closely related to the modern Asian elephant, they evolved into forms of all sizes spread across the Northern Hemisphere. Most mammoths went extinct around 10,000 years ago, at the end of the last Ice Age. It might have been glacial retreats that did them in, but some paleontologists point to a species of hairless ape with a penchant for systematically decimating endemic populations. Some mammoths did however persist in dwarf form on a Siberian island until about 2000 BC, which means they briefly overlapped with ancient Egypt. Hey, dude, you wanna maybe like, you know, wanna maybe like, maybe, you know, to travel, you know, travel thousands of miles through frozen wasteland to discover tiny fluffy elephants? Okay. Fast forward several millennia to a plantation in South Carolina, circa 1725, where a group of slaves had unearthed the colossal bones of an unidentified creature. The plantation owners insisted they must have come from some beast that perished in Noah's flood, but the slaves, originally from Angola in the Congo, recognised them as elephant teeth. Naturalists soon agreed, even if they didn't exactly give appropriate credit for the discovery, and, comparing with fragments from Siberia, determined the teeth once belonged to mammoths. From that point on, Americans were practically tripping over mammoth fossils, and the higher the bones piled up, the higher the profile they attracted. Top of the mammoth pile was one Thomas Jefferson. Founding father, future president, nickel model, and, throughout it all, completely obsessed with mammoths. He wrote about mammoths, he begged people to send him mammoths, he babbled about mammoths to anyone who would listen. Look, Lynn manuel Miranda, I've never asked you for much, but if you could find it in your heart to do one thing for me, one tiny itty-bitty thing, just a remake of Hamilton where Jefferson mentions mammoths every other line, please? Sorry to interrupt, quick point of clarification. The fossils Jefferson and his contemporaries thought were mammoths were in fact mastodons, that other type of Ice Age elephantiform. Mammoths ate grass, mastodons ate leaves. Very different. But Jefferson and the rest of the world at the time called them mammoths, so I shall follow and continue with that name. Alright, pedantry over. Jefferson's love for nature extended beyond mammoths. He once received and examined a fossil with enormous claws on its feet, and days after assuming the vice presidency under John Adams, he addressed the American Philosophical Society regarding the fossil, identifying it as some gigantic mammal. 
He gave it the name Megalonyx, meaning large claw. Though Jefferson speculated that it might be a lion, today we know Megalonyx as a giant ground sloth. Tempting as it may be to paint Jefferson's work as science for science's sake, he had ulterior motives. To understand them, we must though return to France. Meet the Comte de Buffon, nobleman, naturalist, and owner of an endlessly mockable name. Even so, he was one of France's foremost thinkers and held incredible sway over the European populace. And he did not like America. In his Histoire Naturelle, Buffon proposed the theory of American degeneracy, claiming animals and people native to the New World were smaller and weaker than their Old World counterparts, and that those who migrated to the New World would tend towards the same reduction in greatness. He said this was because America was a land of swamps and marshes and dense forests, and generally cramped and wet and unimpressive landscapes. And of course, a bit rich coming from a country whose national animal is a chicken. Despite the obvious flaws in his argument, Buffon found many supporters. Even heavyweights like Kant and Hegel echoed his sentiments. The American response was decidedly angrier. Jefferson in particular knew this was more than simple mudslinging. The soul of his country lay in the balance. If Buffon's ideas prevailed, then America, much like Haiti, would be shunned by the rest of the world and their prejudiced attitudes. All the Founding Fathers' work designing a free country from scratch would be undone by one annoying Frenchman. America needed to prove that it deserved to exist, that it wasn't a worthless land of feeble creatures. Jefferson's mammoth obsession was therefore, to his mind, a patriotic necessity. An elephant larger than any in Africa, born and raised in the land of the free. That'd show those stuck-up Europeans. Well, it would show those stuck-up Europeans if he had more than old bones. But to Jefferson, so many fossils lying around implied live mammoths must be roaming the plains somewhere on the continent. Somewhere out there, his prize, his vindication, his country's future, awaited. In 1801, Jefferson ascended to the presidency. And so, when another annoying Frenchman approached the USA with the offer of Louisiana, well... Mr. President? Enter. Word from our ambassador in France. We have received a most unexpected offer. Oh, and what would that offer be? It appears Napoleon wants to sell us some land. Land? How much? Uh, 530 billion acres of mostly unexplored wilderness. <sighs> Mammoth! Obviously, we can't look inside Jefferson's head to find his true motivation, but it's quite possible that an American president made one of the most important deals in history, partly because he wanted to find a live mammoth. I cannot believe I've only just learnt this. Equally as ridiculous, and another new favourite fun fact, were the parallel scenes behind the French camp's deliberations. Napoleon's brothers objected to the Louisiana Purchase, and barged in to argue with the first consul while he was bathing, prompting a fully naked Napoleon to splash them so much that they shut up. This is completely true. With the Louisiana Purchase secured, Jefferson dispatched Lewis and Clark to scout the vast open spaces he knew must hold entire herds of elephantine beasts. Sure, they had other jobs, little things like making maps and beating Europeans to unclaimed territory, but it was the mammoths that Jefferson truly wanted. Incidentally, Napoleon too enjoyed sending scientific expeditions to newly acquired lands. For his campaign in Egypt, he bought a scholarly entourage, which included the mathematician Joseph Fourier. But when Napoleon abandoned Egypt, he left Fourier behind. The mathematician then became addicted to heat in the sweltering country, eventually developing the mathematical theory of heat transfer, which in particular revealed that all periodic functions are sums of possibly infinitely many sine waves having frequency at integer ratios of the fundamental, which is the basis of the technology currently projecting my voice into your ears and... Oh, uh, apologies, I appear to have veered wildly off topic. Damn, and I was doing so well staying tight and focused. What's this video about again? Oh yeah, mammoth cheese. A year prior to the Louisiana Purchase, John Leyland, a Baptist preacher from Massachusetts, took it upon himself to honour the newly sworn-in president and his love of giant things by presenting him with a most unusual gift. He persuaded the woman of his congregation to prepare an enormous wheel of cheese made from the milk of 900 cows. Then this legend, this mad lad, this absolute Jeffer simp, 
personally escorted the cheese on a three-week journey via sleigh, barge, and wagon to Washington, D.C. Onlookers were astonished, and by the time Leyland reached Washington, the press were thoroughly lampooning the whole thing. One paper joked that bakers in New York were preparing an appropriately proportioned loaf of bread to go with it. Another, aware of Jefferson's fondness for mammoths, called it a mammoth cheese, and the name stuck. Jefferson himself seems to have taken to it, naming its storage room in the White House the Mammoth Room. Owing to its immense size, the mammoth cheese remained in the Mammoth Room for at least two years, providing occasional sustenance to banquet goers until it putrefied and was thrown in the river. The mammoth cheese is the first recorded use of mammoth as an adjective meaning big, and the staying power of that idiom about sums up everyone's excitement at the time. Some captivated soul even wrote a poem called Ode to the Mammoth Cheese. I swear I'm not making this up. Okay, I, I know I said I only required one favour from you, Lin-Manuel Miranda, but I also desperately need you to set this poem to the fattest beat of the 19th century. You know the Mammoth Cube meme? Well, move over, Mammoth Cube. It's all Mammoth Cheese now. Cheese, James Madison. Mammoth Cheese! Ahem. <clears throat> Ode to the Mammoth Cheese gets right to the core of Jefferson's mammoth fixation, with revealing lines such as superior far in smell, taste, weight and size to any ever formed neath foreign skies. Even here, in this tongue-in-cheek ditty about cheese, we find young America's need to be exceptional. Lewis and Clark's mammoth hunt was, of course, a failure. There are no live mammoths in middle America. The explorers almost discovered dinosaurs of the dead variety, but for whatever reason, failed to realise the significance of the giant bones they noticed in Hell Creek, leaving the door wide open for the British to get the jump on the terrible lizards a few decades later. Thank you very much, chaps. Buffon, meanwhile, had in fact died 15 years before the Louisiana Purchase, so never had the chance to rub Jefferson's failure in his face. Though Jefferson had perhaps managed to change his mind before Buffon became Biffoff. After several failed attempts at cross-Atlantic ungulate delivery, Jefferson sent Biffon a stuffed moose. Biffon supposedly renounced the theory of American degeneracy on the spot, but even if he did, the whole death thing meant he never published a correction, and Jefferson's quest to clear America's name went on. And although his elephant hunt turned defunct, Jefferson's persistence and sheer patriotic will kept chipping away at the theory's hold over European minds. Such was Buffon's influence that the idea outlasted Jefferson into the mid-1800s, but it did eventually fade from public acceptance, in no small part thanks to Jefferson and his extinct pachyderms. I love this story. The mammoths, the cheese, the Napoleon, because it says a lot about the origins of the United States psyche. Not satisfied with vast, glorious landscapes and vast, glorious McDonald's portions, Americans also had to have vast, glorious creatures and cheese simply to survive. For better or worse, American exceptionalism has continued and evolved from these humble beginnings, becoming an extreme driving force behind the modern world. A country designed to be bigger, to be better, and a country beloved by its citizens to a frequently frightening degree, for those reasons to this day. Sure, I could complain about that right now, but I am putting media on an American website for a predominantly American audience. So yes, the evidence is clear, America is big and important. We all have Jefferson's mammoth cheese to thank for modern America, so I hope you found this story as interesting as I did. And to the many Americans watching, I hope I, an ignorant Englishman, did your history justice. You guys are all right. At least you're not the French.